We're going to have a, a, a next step class next week. And so for those who've been around for a little while, you know that a next step class is our, our version of a membership class. And even though Adventure, we don't have a formal membership, uh, we do, when we were established as a nonprofit, they did require us to have some form of, of membership. And so though it's not formal within the church, um, those who've attended a next step class, they would have been given an option uh, to fill out a membership form saying they are committed to this church. And, uh, and when you, if, you've, if you've ever filled that out, you are considered, legally considered, a, a member of Venture. Sorry, you're, you're stuck with us. Um, but what we, what, what we have going in next week is this membership class. But the reason we have this membership class coming up is because many of you guys know Pastor Guy I- is leaving, and he'll be, I think he's got three more weeks that he'll be with us. And then we've, we've already began this, this search of a senior pastor. And we, we started the process, so we had our board meet last Sunday, and as part of that meeting, they determined some distinctive, some things that we're going to be looking for as a church to kind of set the, uh, the trajectory of what we want, what we're, we're looking for in the next senior pastor. And then we've got a group of people within Venture that we've put together as a, a committee of some board members, um, some non-board members, some staff that are going to begin, begin the search of finding a new senior pastor. So the job is going to be posted tomorrow, and it'll be live for a couple weeks, just so you guys know the, the process of it. It'll be live for a couple weeks, and then we'll begin the process of whittling those down, going through the, the resumes, and doing some phone interviews. Then what we'll do is this committee will, will determine one, two, three, we, we don't know how many until we see the applicants, but some people that will come back to Venture and uh, we'll do a formal interview process where it'll be in person. They'll meet with our board, and they'll meet with some other members of the church. And so following that, though, uh, the, the, the committee is going to recommend to the elder board one person or two people that we think is right for this position. And the elders are going to look at those, those people, and they're going to make a determination of, of whether they feel like God is leading that person to venture. But the reason I mentioned the membership process is because in our bylaws, which were filled out initially when we became a nonprofit, was in the bylaws, it requires a two-third vote from church members. And so in order for for us to finalize the hiring of a senior pastor, there will be somebody that will be recommended before the church or before those church members, and we'll have to have a two-thirds vote from those who are church members. So when you attend this next step class, or if you choose to attend this next step class next week, um, you'll, you'll be given the option to fill that out and to be officially committed to venture um, in that capacity. So, uh, a- as far as the process goes, it's not going to be um, it's not going to be like an episode of The Bachelor where there's three people up front and we decide to give someone a rose. Okay, it's we're going to recommend one person to the church, and the church can vote yes, no based on that person. Make sense? So, so that's why it's important for next week. Um, if you if you haven't become a member, if you haven't filled out. Um, that, that paper that you do during the membership class, you'll want to attend next week, and then I believe we're going to have another membership class before Guy leaves, and we'll have a couple more. But, uh, but try to make it to this next one if you can. Make sense? All right, so Colossians chapter 3, if you turn there with me. And I'm just going to go ahead and open us up in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for today, and thank you so much for, uh, for how sweet it is to gather together with, with believers, Lord, and, and to gather together with people that are, are more than just acquaintances, Lord, but literally, your, your word says that we are family, that we've all been adopted as children, and, and God, I pray that as we study your word today, Lord, would you do what we, we sang a few minutes ago, and it said, when you speak and when you move, And when you do what only you can do, it changes us, and it changes what we see, and it changes what we seek, Lord. And would that be our prayer this morning, that as we read from your word, as we spend time studying together, Lord, that you would change the way we see and the things that we seek. So Holy Spirit, speak through through me, speak to each heart, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 
So we've been in the book of Colossians for about seven weeks, I want to say. And over these past seven weeks, we've studied this book that was written by, just as a little background, written by a guy named Paul. Paul was, was really known as the first missionary in church history. He had this crazy conversion experience with Jesus and gave his life to the Lord. He turned immediately from being somebody who was killing Christians to a guy who lived and devoted his life to the gospel, to telling the world about Jesus. And so when Paul wrote this letter, Paul was actually in prison. There was, there was a few, few different times that Paul had spent, or a few stints that Paul had in prison. And this specific one, he was in prison for about two years in Rome. And as he, as he was sharing the gospel with people, and as he was doing the work of God, Satan continued to try to keep Paul down. But Paul, while he was in prison, would write letters to different churches throughout the region that he had planted. And so while he was in prison at this time, he had written a few different, few different letters, but this letter was written to the Colossian people. It was a church that he had planted a few years prior to that. And this letter was written to a, a, a church that wasn't looking like our churches typically do today. It was a church that was actually probably taking place in somebody's home. And so in those days, church was, there was no children's ministry, and there was no... Um, you know, sending out flyers for a big Easter service. There was nothing that was big or grand about it. It was simply people gathering together in people's homes and worshiping and studying and singing songs of worship to God. And so it's important to know, and this is just in the context of what we'll be studying today, is that it was families gathered together. So again, there was no children's ministry. So it was children were in this room. If you were five years old, you sat with the big, with the big people. There was no big church and little church. It was everybody gathered together, worshiping together. And Paul in chapter 3, and we had studied this over the last few weeks, is Paul is speaking to those who have said that Jesus Christ is the Lord of their life. He was talking to people who, who weren't like half-hearted in their relationship with God. These were people that had given everything they had to Jesus. They had given up. Many of them had, had lost their families to follow Jesus. Many of them had risked possible persecution and death to follow Jesus. And so th these were people that had truly made Jesus Lord of their life. There was no partiality to it. They, they, they had given everything to Jesus. They had declared that, you know, he's the Lord of my life. And so as he's speaking to us today, I want us to remember that in this context, that he's speaking to people who have said, Jesus is the Lord of my life. If he tells me, hey, you know what, I need to sell everything I have and go to China and serve God in China, I'm going to do it. And sure, it might be a struggle and it might be like, I might have to work through things and pray through, through different things, but I'm going to do it. If God tells me to sell my home and, and to give all my equity and, and put that and give that to a nonprofit organization that serves the poor or, or, or serves people in Africa, orphans in Africa, then I'm going to do it. And so this idea of, of, of following God and letting him be the Lord of your life, that was serious for them. And so he's, that's who he's directing this to. And so in the previous verses, he starts ta he's talking to the Colossian people of how they ought to live with one another in, in the church context. So as we, as we read this, he's talking to those in a church context. And he tells them, you know what, guys, when, when people are experiencing heartache and pain, you are to bear with one another's burdens. You're to be present in each other's life. You're, you're not to just do a uh, tear-faced emoji on Facebook and consider yourself as reaching out to somebody who's going through a hard time. You're to go. You're to call that person. You're to be present in that person's life. You're to, to be a comfort, whether it's giving meals, whether it's being someone who just listens, whether it's being someone who prays. You're to be present in those people's life. He also says that you are to forgive one another. And so he's saying, Hey, hey, it's not you have one issue and then you go and you, you, you leave the church or you leave people around. You're, you're to forgive one another. Like that's part of being a follower of Jesus and God's sanctification in our life is forgiving one another. And then he was talking about, you know, we're to sing songs of hymns to, to God. We're to do all these, all these things in the context of the church. But then he, then he shifts his focus onto the family. And he shifts his focus onto the family. And the, I think the reason he does this, and one of the key things I see in my life, is that who I am with my family is who I ultimately am. Is that true? 
who, who I am with my family is who I ultimately am. Like, I can, I can stand up here and I can give you two hours of putting a smile on my face and being, being nice and cordial and doing those sort of things. But who I am when I go home and when I'm tired and when I'm talking to my wife and I talk to my kids, a, a, as, as unflattering as that can be, that's who I am. That's really my character. That's really what's going on inside of me. And so he's talking to, to the family, and he starts. And, and Pastor Guy, if you remember, last week he had talked about, uh, talking, he talked about uh, marital relationships and how men, you're to submit to your wives. Wives, you're, submit, you're to submit to your husband. And that's one of the things I love about Jesus and I love about Scripture is that he usually doesn't just speak to, like, one person and, like, call somebody out. Like, he, he, he'll, he'll call somebody out, and then he'll call out the guy that was getting self-righteous. Like, he, he speaks to all of us. There, there's this principle where anytime God speaks, it's for you. It's for me. Well, I just really wish my, my parents were here today to hear this message. No, it, it's about you. It's about your relationship with God. And so, let's take a look. Colossians chapter 3. says this, children, verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. So again, it says, children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Now, Stick a finger there and, and turn a few pages back. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. And this is also another letter that Paul had written while he was in prison to a different set of people. But he says something very similar to this. And he says in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and in the instruction of the Lord. So it seems like this is kind of important to Paul. That the fact that he's in prison, he's probably thinking about the same things. I don't know if he wrote these letters right next to each other or not, but he instructs the same exact things. He says, children, make sure you honor your father and mother. In the version we read today, he says, make sure you obey your father and mother. And fathers, do not provoke your children. Do not exasperate your children. And there, uh, of all of the, the possible themes of what a family should look like in Scripture— The most common one is honor your father and mother. You see that in every book of the Bible except three books of the Bible. It's everywhere. It's this theme where where God has called us to honor honor our father and mother, not just so things will get done around the house and not because we've got a home and we've got to work together as a family to get things done, but the reason we're called to honor our father and mother is that we learn to obey and honor God as we honor our father and mother. If you learn to obey your parents, you learn to obey God. If you learn to obey and honor authorities in your life, you will learn to obey and honor God. Or another way of saying this, if you want a thriving relationship with God, you've got to be able to willingly be obedient to your parents. You've got to be willing to willingly be obedient to your parents. And and why is this? It's because we always have authority. No matter where you're at in your life, you will always have somebody in authority over you. As kids, you've got your parents, and you've got your teachers, and you've got your coaches, and you've got all sorts of authorities in your life. As adults, though, things don't change at all. We've always got a boss, or we've always got um, an, an eldership in a church, and ultimately, we've always got God as an authority. And so if we don't like authority and we have issues with authority, then we're going to have a really hard time following Jesus. We're going to have a really hard time following God. And so how do we we know that I've got an issue with authority, or how do we know that somebody has an issue with authority? Well, I would say this. If, If every boss was stupid and didn't know what he was talking about, 
you've probably got an issue with authority. If every church you've been to and every pastor didn't get it, then you've probably got an issue with authority. That's something I've been working through in my life is, is working through, like, I, just a few months ago, I was looking and seeing that, you know what, I don't really have accountability in my life, other than the elders of the church and other than Pastor Guy and, and all that. Like, who is actually looking into my life? Who, who, have, who is actually discipling me and, and that I can be really honest with and can see the real me? And I realized I don't have that. And so I've worked to change that. And so if we've got issues with authority— we're going to have a big issue with walking with God because the system that we've bought into, the system that we've all agreed to be a part of, this Christianity thing, this following God thing, it's a system in which everyone is called to obedience and authority under somebody. But ultimately, the lordship of God. When I, when I gave my life to the Lord, I said, you are the Lord of my life. You're the CEO. You're the boss. Okay? I, I, no longer what I want. It, it's not important. It's what you say, God. And so if I make something that is cultural, if I make a decision that's culturally stupid and, and sell everything that I have and give it to the poor, I did it because he was the Lord, that he, he's the boss. And so when it comes to authority, that's something that, that can be, if we ingrain this into our, our thinking, into our mindset, that, you know what, if I honor those people in authority over me right now, it mirrors and it directly affects our relationship with God, our obedience to God. But what if the person doesn't know what they're talking about? They're a horrible leader. They're a bad boss. They're a bad parent. That exists, right? Well, we're called to honor those who are in authority over us. So, so let, me, let me draw a distinction really quick. So there is, a, in, in the version of Colossians, Paul says you are to obey your parents. And then in, uh, in Ephesians, and also in the fifth commandment, he says to honor your parents. So what is the difference between honoring and obeying? Well, if you're, if you're a child, if you are under the authority of your parents' leadership, and that might mean you're 21 years old and mom and dad are paying for college and are paying for your cell phone bill, you are still under the authority of mom and dad. And so you are called to obedience in some things, right? Oh, wait. Obedience in everything. And so if mom and dad have the authority in your life, you are submissive. You obey them. And that is how you honor your mom and dad. But what happens if you are an adult? What happens if you are past college, you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 90s, and you're no longer in the home? How do you honor God? Well, the Hebrew word for honor is literally means like to, to put weight onto something. And so as we honor our parents, we put weight into things that they say. We put weight into their feelings. We, it, honor is seen as something that is done out of humility, where we step back and we say, you know what, my goal is to give you reverence and respect and honor. And so what are some ways that we can honor our parents, even being adults, even being past that age, because again, the fifth commandment doesn't say honor your parents when you're in the household. It's honor your parents forever. It's honor, honor, honor. We're all called, called to honor our parents. And so I want to take a look at a, a few ways that we can do that. Uh, number one, we can forgive our parents. And, and give our parents a little bit of Respect, and, and, and obviously as you get older and you have children of your own, you realize how hard parenting is. I'm just in the process. I'm six weeks into this, okay? So I, <laughs> but, but I understand that there is an understanding as you grow and as you become a parent, you realize that, like, this is not as easy as I thought. And, and oftentimes, there's always, th it seems to be there's that phase of, like, college or right after you leave the house where kids begin to get a little bitter towards their parents. And they wish, man, I wish my parents would have done this better. I really felt like I was lacking this as a kid. And that's just the nature of living in a sinful world with parents that may be awesome parents, but they're also sinners. We're all sinners. And so a great way that we can honor our parents is just by forgiving them, giving them a break, just as Christ has forgiven us. Another way we can honor our parents is to speak well of them. 
is to speak well of them. And, and we're in a day and age where when it comes to authority, we, man, you just go on Facebook and you log in and you could tell the world what you think about this president. And you could tell this world what you think about your local leaders. And you could tell the world what you think of all of these authorities in your life. But when it comes to our parents, when it comes to those who are in authority of us, perhaps we could speak well of them. Perhaps we can speak well of them, not just publicly, but privately, when we're behind closed doors, that we would speak well of our, our parents. Another thing is to esteem them publicly and privately, is to tell our parents, is to sit down and tell them whether your parents are 80 years old or your parents are 50 years old, is to sit down and tell them, Mom and Dad, thank you so much for when you did this. I, I remember telling my parents a, a few years ago, and I sat down with them, and I just told them, Mom and Dad, thank you. I, I know we didn't have, like, a ton of money growing up. And thank you so much that you taught us. You taught us to value the little things. That when we, when we went out to restaurants, we didn't just get to order, you know, a fl- filet mignon, but we had to ask Mom and Dad, can we order some something, a meal, or we'd go to Taco Bell, can we order a meal, or can we order a burrito, and I, and I told my parents, like, thank you so much for that, because what it caused me to do, and it caused me to think, was, like, caused me to be thankful for just the little things, it caused me to appreciate things more than I feel like a lot of my friends got to appreciate things, and so perhaps a way you can honor your parents is by esteeming them, is by pulling them aside, and sharing that with them. Additionally, another way we we can do that is to seek their wisdom. And whether or not we completely respect their wisdom, whether or not they're they're believers or not, Scripture tends to say, er, Scripture tends to show that youth oftentimes has a way of, of thinking with folly, thinking with immaturity. But as you grow and as you become an adult, as you grow in maturity, you you grow in wisdom. And so maybe you don't take it as an adult who's listening to their adult parents. Maybe you don't take it, but maybe you honor them enough and you respect them enough to ask them, what do you think about this? What's your thoughts on this? And then lastly, a way that we can support, a way that we can honor our parents is by supporting them. And and many of you guys are in this phase where your parents are getting older and they took care of you as you were growing up and now... It's time to take care of them. And so as far as supporting them and just saying, you know what, Mom and Dad, I'm, I'm never going to I'm never gonna leave you. Like, I'm not going to leave you out to dry. Like, I'm going to be, if you need a place to live, I'm going to provide you a place to live. If you need help financially and I can do it, I'm going to help. And so these are different ways we can honor our parents. The list could go on, but here's, that, those are just a few thoughts on that. But let's continue uh, this passage. So Colossians chapter 3, and now we're going to look at verse 21. And it says this, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Okay, most versions say, do not provoke your children, or they will become discouraged. And so in those days, just just so we we have an understanding, when, when they referred to fathers, fathers were seen as the supreme leaders of their households. And so it, it's very easy to, if we, if we want to, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to compare this to women so that it, we're talking about parents. Fathers and women, parents, do not provoke your children so that they may become discouraged. And in those days, and as Paul's writing to the people of the Colossian church, he's telling, he, he's speaking to them, as, and they know, and they've got an understanding that the men are the supreme leaders of the household. And so what was common in those days, if you were having, if you had a kid that was unruly and wasn't listening and, and never respected your family, you had the ability to sell them into slavery. You had the ability to put them in chains and, and working out in the field. And you ultimately had the authority for capital punishment. You could kill them. And so Paul's speaking to this Colossian church who, like, this was... This was totally countercultural to what they were used to. And he's telling them, 
guys, I want you to change the world. I want you to be different. I want people to know that I am the king of your life just by the way you treat your children. Do not provoke them. Do not cause them, and, and, and one way of, of saying this is do not cause them, their spirits to be crushed. And as parents, and as working in youth ministry for 10 years, I, I've witnessed it. Where kids feel crushed because their parents were too hard on them, or they expected too much of them, or they were emotionally distant from them, or they weren't present in their life. And I've seen kids turn into lively children into apathetic teenagers who lost hope. And, and when you think about it, like think about people who are in authority of us. Like one thing I think about is I think of politicians. I think of government, okay? So most of us, you know, we, we get excited around election time and we think things are going to change. This is going to be awesome. Oh my goodness. And then all of a sudden things don't change or things change for the worse. And then we're left feeling what? We feel discouraged. We feel apathetic. And, and then we don't really want to tune in because it's like, what's the point, right? Like they're just politicians a politician. They're going to do what they're going to do. And for kids, they have, this, they have the ability to feel discouraged and beat down. And so what are some ways, what are some ways that fathers can provoke their children? Now, see, the first thing is they can make more withdrawals than they make deposits. So one way a father can discourage their kid, can, can crush their spirit, is by making more deposits or making more withdrawals than deposits. And what I mean is when you encourage somebody, when you speak life into them, you are depositing into them. You're giving something. You're giving them a gift. When you withdraw from them, that's, that's saying something maybe critical or giving them some instruction, which is important because... Huge part of parenting is discipline. That's what Christ, that's what God has done for us throughout history. And so that's essential. But when it becomes the negativity out of our mouth becomes dominant over the positivity, when there's not encouragement, when we're not stopping and celebrating their little successes, then what can happen is a kid can get crushed and discouraged. Another way, is, is parents who can micromanage their kids. And being way too involved in directing the decisions and out kids of their kids. And, and it's well-meaning, and, and the intent is good because you want the best for your kids. But when, so at some point, kids will get discouraged and feel like, well, mom and dad don't trust me to do things on my own. And they can get tamped down and feel like, you know what, I... I I can't wait to get out of the house because then I can actually make decisions. I can actually do things. And part of, part of parenting and part of the biblical form of parenting is not driving your kids to something. It's leading your kids to something. It's shepherding them to what's good, not forcing them into what's good. But obviously it depends on the age and it depends on where they're at in their life. But ultimately, God's called us to shepherd. As if pastors shepherd your flock, as parents shepherd your children, not drive them to make the right decisions. Another way that we can provoke children is through hypocrisy. You can sit and you can tell your kids, hey, watch your mouth. Don't cuss. But then you, you're talking to your friends and you're doing this, the exact same thing. Hey, kids, make sure you honor your mother. Make sure you treat your mother with respect. But then they see you treating your mother with disrespect. Don't treat your sister that way. But then you can treat other people in a negative way. Another thing is when it comes to honoring our father and mother, we can tell them, honor, honor me. I'm your parents. I'm your parents. Respect me. But then they see us only speak negatively towards our parents and dishonor them through what we say. And so hypocrisy is something that can discourage a kid and cause them to think, man, Everybody's like that. All church people, all, all parents, all people just say something and they don't actually live it. Another way we can discourage our kids is through pushing for achievement. And, uh, and John MacArthur says this. He says, um, 
Parents provoke their children by pushing achievement beyond reasonable bounds. A child can be so pressured to achieve that he is virtually destroyed. He quickly learns that nothing he does is sufficient to please his parents. No sooner does he accomplish one goal than he is challenged to accomplish something better. Fathers who fantasize their own achievements through the athletic skills of their sons or mothers who fantasize a glamorous career through the lives of their daughters prostitute their responsibility as parents. And so pushing people for achievement rather than celebrating our kids for the successes that they have, finding the good in them and celebrating those things. And then last thing is fathers can be emotionally absent. There, there's always something to do, that whether it's doing, working in the garage or working on the car or, or going to work, there's always something that takes priority. It, or, or even if you're just sitting on, in the, on the TV and watching TV and your kids are there and you don't engage with them, you don't dress up for the tea party, dads, and sit down and have the tea party with them. And so one way we can provoke kids is is through being emotionally absent. And let, let me just read this from, from one father who was recalling his time with his kids. And he said this, my, f- my family's all grown up and the kids are all gone. But if I had to do it all over again, this is what I would do. I would love my wife more in front of my children. I would laugh with my children more at our mistakes and our joys. I would listen more, even to the littlest child. I would be more honest about my own weaknesses, never pretending perfection. I would pray differently for my family. Instead of focusing on them, I'd focus on me. I would do more things together with my children. I would encourage them more and bestow more praise. I would pay more attention to little things like deeds and words of thoughtfulness. And then finally, if I had to do it all over again, I would share God more intimately with my family. Every ordinary thing that happened in every ordinary day, I would use to direct them to God. And so Paul tells us, honor your father and mother. Doesn't matter the age. Doesn't matter if you're, if you're 60 or if you're 10. Honor your father and mother because this creates in us in obedience to God because God has put people in authority over us. And he tells us as, as parents, as fathers, and I believe as mothers, he's saying make sure that you don't discourage your kids, that you don't provoke them so that, that they end up having spirits that are crushed. And the wonderful thing about believing in a God that we do and being a part of this family that he's created is that he has enabled us to be agents of reconciliation. And so when we think through the failures that we have, which we all do, which we all do, we have the ability to come and, we, and, and to sit down with, with our, our parents or, or with our children and say, you know what, I was wrong here. I blew it. Nothing will change a child's spirit than a parent saying, I was wrong. Likewise, saying and freeing your parents of of some of you guys who have had parents that weren't great at what they did, to be honest. To be able to sit down and say, you know what? I forgive you in some instances or looking at the positives and what they've done, because everyone's done positives, right? And say, thank you so much for doing this in my life. We have the ability to reconcile. We have the ability to take situations that have sin and, and junk mixed within them and make them a glorious thing that God uses for his glory and our benefit. And so, would you pray with me? And let's come to the Lord. And ask him to to bless this in each of our lives. Lord, we ask you, we need your your wisdom and your grace in our lives. Whether we're kids who have issues with obedience, whether we're adults who have fallen short of your, your, your standard for them, Lord, we are all in need of your grace. And we're all in need of reconciliation with those around us. 
And I pray that our thought this, this morning would not be to focus in on the, the issues that other people have. Oh, I really wish this person was here. Oh, I wish this person heard it. But that we would focus on our part of it. Because true growth doesn't come from looking outside of ourselves, but looking within ourselves. And so, God, I ask your blessing over each person today, Lord. Would we be agents of reconciliation? You have reconciled us back to God. Would we reconcile even the most difficult situations and relationships? In your holy name, we pray. Amen.